Good morning, everybody. I hope you had a great week and uh, let's get started in about three minutes. So let me ask people, um, how do you find the two weeks so far? Um, is there any question that you want to double check with me before we get started? I saw some people typing. Good morning, uh, Tijia and Sam. Uh, feel free to let me know if you have any questions so far about anything, about your assessment, about anything that you want to double check. I have received uh, a couple of emails asking me different questions. Uh, and I, apparently I can tell uh, some of the people did not attend the lecture. So uh, I hope you could all attend the lecture and then uh, we'll be on, you know, you'll be on track. So the questions I received include whether the assessment should be done in English or Chinese. So I told the student it should be done in English. And uh, I also got questions about um, the presentation, whether it could be pre-recorded or not. So no, it, it couldn't be, uh, it shouldn't be uh, pre-recorded. You're just presenting uh, that on Blackboard Collaborate. And uh, don't worry about the internet connection problem. So uh, you wouldn't be penalized uh, if your presentation is uh, disrupted by uh, the uh, internet, um, poor internet connection. Yeah. And do you have other questions that you want to double check with me before we get started? And I can't see your face. So that means everybody is clear. Everybody is clear with what uh, they're doing and uh, what they will be doing. Okay, yeah. And the other thing is uh, for the presentation, um, as you can see uh, on the presentation signing sheet, we have uh, quite a few number of people presenting each time. Uh, if you could, uh, you know, some of you want to, switch to uh, a certain week, for example, week 10, uh, week nine, uh, just to balance the number a little bit, that will be uh, very helpful because that will give us time to discuss your case study. And uh, we could do reading discussion in the toot as well. Yeah, and some of you who are enrolled online could also do your presentation in the face-to-face -face tutorial. So that will help to balance the number two. Maybe just once, you know, just uh, present your uh, topic there and then you just, uh, you know, keep going uh, with the online sessions. That's all good. Of course, that's um, that refers to people uh, who are here in Sydney, but uh, a number of you are overseas, I understand. So we'll just do that online. Everything is good. Okay, so it seems there is no question from people. Everything is fine, yeah? I would like to, you know, get some response from you. I just feel like me talking to myself. Anyway, I would assume you, you know, you're fine with everything. And I'll just, uh, let's get started. Okay, great. Chijia, good to hear. All, everything is good. Yeah. And uh, let me just share, you share the screen with you so we can get started. 
Uh, let me check. Those to disable participation screen sharing. What is this? Doesn't allow me to share the screen. Why? The message I got on my screen is a host disabled participant screen sharing. I need to find out what happened. Why that I'm not able to share my screen with you. Just give me a few seconds. All right, now, okay, I think I've just fixed the problem. It's weird that I wasn't a host just now, and now I'm able to share my screen with you. I don't know what happened. Uh, very well, all oh, good. Let me. Okay, now you should be able to see my screen now and uh let's just get started so uh first thing as usual we're gonna do do a recap we're recapping last week's lesson so last week think what have we learned the first question is what is the difference between intragenerational mobility and intergenerational mobility one is intro the other one is inter and second one, the similarities between marriage migration in China and transnational marriage migration in Asia. Think about the gendered aspects of that, the gendered differences between these two kinds of mobilities. And uh, the third one is which marriage law may break down in mutual affection is grounds for divorce. That is gan in Chinese. And uh, next one, the legal minimum age for men and women to get married in China today. And the last one is why did China replace the one child policy with the two child policy? Two simple uh, reasons. Now I want to give you five minutes just to think on your own. And then I'll check with people who are understanding about these questions. Five minutes.
try to use your brain, you know, rather than looking back at the uh, lecture slides to see whatever information that you could recall. Yeah. And that is the thing, the knowledge that retain in your mind. And that is the thing that you won't forget. Yeah. You have three minutes. <sighs> Okay, now let's have a look. First question, anybody, the difference between intro and intergenerational mobility? You could raise your hand or you can directly just, uh, you know, come and say. Can I have a go? Sure, Ashley, go, yeah. Um, intergenerational mobility as a, as a social movement in her lifespan yep good within the person's lifespan right yeah that's the changes that happens uh, within uh, the course of uh, one's lifespan good what about inter um intergenerational mobility is uh, changes in social status uh, between their generations always in the same family okay good yeah correct changes across different generations within the same family and that is intergenerational mobility okay and uh, the next question the similarities between marriage migration in china and transnational marriage migration in asia we touched on that uh, last week it went quick to see if anybody have already captured that the gendered differences and similarities. Anybody? The second one. Think firstly, are there more women than men or more men than women, you know, in terms of uh, marriage migration in China and Asia? So apparently, it's, yeah, uh, Annabelle, Annabella? I think right? there's more women than men. Okay, and great. So that's the first one, right? Yeah, so that's usually, gendered. Mm. And usually they move to another place for sort of upward mobility in the social mobility upward mobility yes mm. so upward here refers to like what, what does that mean upward so from better, uh, 
a better socioeconomic um, status. Sure. So their motivation is to improve their social economic status, and that's why what we see is they are flowing from less developed societies to developed societies. Right. Good. That's the second feature, and there is another feature. which is women, they're prone to risks of uh, abuse, right? During the migration mm -hmm. process. We talked about international right trafficking, right? Remember? Yeah. Yeah, good. And so within China, women also tend to be abused and they face violence and so during this mobility process. So here are the three features. Thanks very much, uh, Annabella. And uh, the third one, the marriage law made break down in mutual affection as grounds for divorce. Which marriage law was that? 1980 marriage law. Okay, great. Thank you. It's the 1981. Yep. Yeah. And uh, next one, the legal minimum age for men and women uh, to get married in China. Um. Stephanie, yeah, St Steph, sorry, yeah. Uh, 22 for men and 20 for women. Good, yeah, and the last question, why China wanted to replace the one-child policy with the two-child policy? What's the reason? Uh, to solve gender imbalance, to, like, rebalance the ratio between female and male. Uh... That, that's not quite the major reason. Think uh, if simply just, uh, you know, replacing the one child, one child policy with the two child policy, uh, the main purpose wasn't to just to balance the gender ratio. No, mm. think of other factors. Um, the problem of aging and also the shrinking workforce. Sure. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah. So aging. Uh, because there are more and more people are getting old in China. So that creates economic burden, right? So at the same time, uh, the, as that's just the one top policy, that means the workforce is shrinking. Uh, less and less and people are able to contribute their labor uh, to the economic production. So that's why the government was thinking we need more people. Uh, that's why uh, they um, replaced the one child policy with the two child policy. Okay. Thanks very much to whoever contributed your ideas just now. And now let's move on to our uh, new topic today, economics, urbanization, and rural urban divide. The outline, firstly, is we are dividing the lecture into three parts. The first one is on gender and work during the Maoist period. That's from the 1950s to 70s. We'll look at uh, how gender, uh, you know, was like uh, during the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, any gendered features, uh, and uh, the gendered practice at Danwei uh, work unit. And part two is um, the reform era from 1979 till present. We'll look at the impact of uh, the state-owned enterprises, uh, especially when uh, the, the impact of um, the SOE restructuring on women. And then we'll look at the gender inequality and segregation in the labor market. And uh, it's still an issue uh, today. And part three is uh, on hukou and rural urban divide. Yeah. And uh, so the first one, uh, from 1950s to 1960s. So to meet the demand of uh, socialist development, here I'm in industrial and agriculture production, Mao Zedong declared, ah, in order to build a great socialist society, it is most important to mobilize the masses of women to join in productive activity. So uh, Mao Zedong said that, right? So how did he or other communist members uh, helped to mobilize women? So the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, created lots of discourses during that time, including propaganda posters, government reports, media and slogans, etc. 
One, uh, to, to realize that goal, to mobilize women into workforce. And one of that, the powerful slogans uh, was women hold up half the sky. Yep. So uh, that slogan, I think a lot of people know, what's that in Chinese? Right? That's sorry, uh, So if you see the posters here, uh, these are some of the posters uh, got really popular during Mao's campaign to mobilize women into workforce. Uh, look at the first one. That says, we're very proud to contribute to the industrial development in China. Second one says, adopting the long march spirit to build our country. And the third one is the powerful slogan that says, women hold up half the sky. And uh, the last one is very similar as well, saying women hold up half the sky. If you see these posters, these women, right, they are very happy. You notice that, right? And uh, look at their clothes, right? What do they wear? They wear work uniform, right? And see their roles, what do they do? They are not in uh, the domestic domain. They're not just doing, you know, household chores, right? Instead, what are they doing? Uh, they're working in factories, right? They are working the, in the agriculture field, etc. And this is all for uh, socialist production, as we just mentioned, right? And uh, so uh, you could see the, the government propaganda really helped to encourage the women to participate in this socialist production, which is, you know, desperately needed by the country during that time. And at the same time, these messages uh, were telling that it's very important that women should play a role to hold up half the sky. Uh, so women are as equal as men as they can hold half of the sky, right? Yeah, okay. And uh, moving on to the land reform campaign. I'm sure if, if you can see that, uh, I'll move that down here. So the land reform campaign. So in early 1950s to uh, 1950s, uh, China got this land reform uh, law and campaign. So what happened was um, the land, the, 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 the government confiscated land from uh, the landlords and uh, wealthy families and then redistributed those land to peasants uh, uh, regardless of um, the age, sex, or you know who received that land. So that means women also shared and you know get an equal share of the land. So women were very happy uh, by sh by receiving their own share of land. So before you can imagine, they didn't. Uh, they they got they couldn't get any land. Uh, they got no resources. But uh, ever since 1950. Uh, women uh, got their equal share. So they that means uh, they could leave the household to work. Uh, before that, they did not have any land. They stayed home, they, 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 care, they take care of kids, uh, their families. But ever since they got the land, uh, their share, they could work on that. That means they gained increased mobility. Yeah, and at the same time, uh, by uh, cropping this land, they could earn money, right? So they have uh, become more economically and financially independent. Uh, uh, despite during that time, women were paid less than men. We could see it's still a progress. Yeah. And uh, the land reform law that time stipulated that the property division should be equal in case of divorce. So men and women uh, were equal legally in terms of all aspects. Uh, and uh, uh, women gained uh, so, so their land and mobility, uh, but the land allocated to women were in actual fact um, controlled by their husbands in a lot of families. So we could see um, 
on the one hand, the state made it equal for men and women. And on the other hand, um, in actual practice, it's still quite unequal because the land that women received was uh, controlled by their husbands. So that suggests China's patriarchal tradition remains very strong during that time. And uh, moving on to this, uh, this is um, the poster uh, during the land reform campaign. Uh, what it says is um, the land reform has uh, almost completed and some of the achievements done uh, by the government. Um, so during that time, peasants uh, were also denouncing the former landlord uh, because as said, the land were uh, confiscated from the landlord because the landlord bullied the peasants uh, for a long time. And that is the time for peasants to fight back. So uh, during this campaign, they were denouncing their former landlord. And that actually caused uh, a lot of deaths uh, of um, the land uh, during that time. Uh, I have a video here uh, just to quickly show you um, the scene of uh, denouncing. This is a, a short clip about bringing down the landlord. And back to my slide here. Uh, so, uh, Ever since the first land reform, China actually uh, carried out a second land reform. And that campaign uh, was um, on the collectivization uh, of land that happened during the mid-1950s. So during that process, uh, individual farmers were also uh, compelled to join collectives, uh, which formed the thing called the People's Commune. And uh, so that's about the land, land reform. And then moving on to the Great Leap. The Great Leap Forward is from 1957 to 1960. So during this time, uh, Mao Zedong launched this campaign. Uh, women were further encouraged to uh, get involved in socialist production and working together with men. Uh, so there's rise in demand of socialist production. And this provided work opportunities for women. And uh, approximately 90% women earned some wages during this time. And their identities changed from being just housewives to workers. And you can see women's identities kept changing ever since the land reform, the Great Leap Forward, uh, some of the political campaigns launched by the state. And now at the stage, you can think, okay, the state did play an important role in driving, uh, motivating women uh, to, to, to work and uh, making them independent and uh, et cetera, et cetera, and increase their mobility. So all, all of these uh, uh, are state driven. And later when we talk more uh, about uh, some of the uh, initiatives done by the state and also, see, this is indeed uh, in China, feminism is driven by the state. Okay, we'll just point out that point uh, for now. Okay. And at this time, back to the Great Leap Forward, many women performed uh, uh, equal amount of work, labor as men. However, they received lower paid jobs. Yeah. And women also played a dual role. Dual role. Uh, they were, you know, taking care of the family and work at the same time. Uh, but uh, at the same time, they were encouraged to have more children. So why were women encouraged to have more children? Because think, this is the great leap forward, and the state needed labor, needed labor uh, to build uh, China's economy. So uh, that fall uh, that I mean that the responsibility fall on the shoulder of women that means women will need to bear more children especially son uh, to, to to contribute to this uh, labor force to the state that's not fair to them and the uh, daughter during that time became daughters became natural nurturers in family uh, many many of the girls uh, they um, they sacrificed to their younger brother when there were opportunities for, for, for example, for education. 
uh, for work uh, when there are multiple children in a family is always the boys uh, who are chosen uh, to do the work outside home or to receive the education. So you can see gender inequality was uh, built during the earlier time and then generation by generation and you can see uh, the gender gap has been widening ever since then uh, the origin uh, could be traced to here so despite women gained greater mobility and uh, greater independence since the movements and uh, so what we could see is these movements indeed give women a lot of uh, you know space to grow and become independent economically and socially and increase their status at the same time there uh, were new inequalities yeah so everything has two sides uh, pros and cons yeah and uh, women's dual burden during this time so on women's dual burden we could see um, a quote here from a People's Daily. We know People's Daily, right? People's Daily is the state organ. And a quote from People's Daily reads, participation in agriculture production is the inherent right and duty of rural women, giving birth to children and raising them, as well as preoccupation with the household chores are also the obligations of rural women. Okay, at this point, I just wanna check with people. What do you think about this quote? How do people understand this quote? It's this still your, part of, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, who is um, this? Annabelle. Annabelle. Yep. Go. Cool. Yep. It's still kind of sexist when um they're still trying to tell a woman what they should or should not do. Should not do. Yes. Good. Yeah. You can see this is um the uh, the state perspective and obviously the state uh, socialist ideology here uh, did not really see the dual burden of women uh, but took it for granted right this is what they thought they thought women this is what <laughs> women's natural duty right and you can see who dominated the party okay obviously they were all males right predominantly males so all of these were from males perspective and which regulated everyday life yeah and that really constrained women and uh, the shaped uh, gender relations uh, which is um you know created hidden gender inequalities you can't really you know see immediately uh, but that's entrenched in everyday life yeah and when women internalize that ideology, and you can think, oh, they would take that for granted as well. They would not comply. That will create a spiral of silence. A women would not comply. Uh, they would just do things that they think they should be doing, and they would do it. Yeah. Okay. And uh, next one uh, is the. Uh, we'll continue with that. So we're talking about. Uh, people's uh, commune just now uh, right so uh, that's been created during the mid 1950s so uh, people's commune uh, in 1950s uh, late 1950s Mao Zedong declared that China has completed the transition to socialism and should prepare to make a great leap forward to communism so it's time for communism therefore uh, the state uh, wanted uh, the people to build people's communes uh, people's commune and you can see uh, uh, this is like a big family thing uh, in, in the local area everybody work together they eat together there are people who take you know who cook for you and and uh, basically you spend uh, your full time uh, together working for the same the common goal to build uh, socialism yeah and uh, uh, to enhance that uh, to transition to communism so around 300 million women were mobilized to work uh, in production brigade uh, that's uh, the smaller unit of people's commune and then many full-time female laborers uh, 
many many women were, were, were working in the agricultural sector and many were uh, working in nurseries and public dining rooms uh, that's um, a major role played by women in building this people's commune and uh, but the thing is um, as everybody work right everybody you know we're doing their utmost women only can you know um, earned uh, one uh, or only sorry women only earned half or a third of men's uh, work points. So a work point is a method of evaluating the amount of work somebody performs in a rural community. So uh, say it's usually men earn say 10 work points during the day and uh, women would earn eight maximum and there is a cap there uh, during that time. And uh, men uh, always got these heavy work. Uh, women got uh, the light work. So there's some, um, you know, biological difference between the nature of the work and that tied to the amount of uh, remuneration and rewards that men and women receive. So that really shaped uh, the the, the, um, the amount of money uh, that women uh, and men received. Uh, so. Uh, Obviously, light work requires no uh, less uh, physical energy than heavy work. So that's why women get less than men. And when uh, there's um, when non-agricultural work became available uh, inside the families, the principle was uh, males first, senior males first and senior first. So women, uh, they had to compensate uh, for the labor shortage in the agriculture production caused by male employment in new industries. That means when there were, you know, non-agricultural work available, it's always uh, the boys in the family who get that opportunity to do that work. And instead, uh, women continue to to work in the agriculture field. So what we could see now is... Um, is the gender inequality still persist uh, when there were non-agricultural uh, opportunities became available. And this is a form of gender uh, disc discrimination as well, right? And uh, so the new opportunities you were asking, what were they? You know, these opportunities involved the mining, power plants, machine building, cement plants. Look at these work. And you can think, can a woman do that? Apparently it's men's job, right? And that's why men got that priority opportunities to do those, whereas women don't. Uh, and uh, in villages, women perform the same work as men. And uh, male peasants uh, still complain. Uh, they thought, okay, uh, they were the head of households and they contribute more than women to family budget and therefore they should demand a higher pay. Uh, so uh, this inequality always existed there, you could see uh, in, the, in rural China. And at the same time, as said, women's housework were naturalized. At the same time, it was devalued. Uh, and the sexual division of labor uh, was pretty uh, apparent. However, when that, you know, when sexual division of labor decreased, sexual division of authority remains the same. That means the ideology is still there. So uh, the patriarchal value remained very, very strong. And uh, that's something that you can't change. Yeah, you can hardly change. And here are some of the posters that glorifying uh, people's communes, uh, highlighting the importance of uh, people's communes. And uh, as a way, people were all mobilized uh, into building this uh, big communes uh, for uh, building communism. And uh, this is the, oh, I can use my pen, right? This is the big kitchen. <laughs> And uh, this is uh, people working in the agricultural field. And you can see a lot of women, uh, especially. Uh, so men and women were working together in the agricultural field. And the poster, both men and women here 
uh, they are happy, very happy building communism, uh, laughing, uh, etc., etc. Yeah, and uh, moving on to next one. Okay. Oh, I need to clean this one up. Uh, eraser. So uh, during the Cultural Revolution from the 1960s to 70s, uh, let me move on. Okay, this is uh, okay. So during the Cultural Revolution, a number of people were sent down to uh, the countryside uh, to work with peasants. So just now we talked about people's communes, right? We talked about uh, rural China. Now we're moving to urban China, right? So in urban China during the Cultural Revolution period, a large number of youths were sent down to the countryside to learn from peasants uh, during this period. And uh, Mao Zedong said the countryside is a vast expanse of heaven and earth where uh, we can flourish. So a lot of urban youths were mobilized to work uh, together with their uh, peasant counterparts in rural China. There were millions of them sending down to the countryside to learn from farmers. And uh, either, you know, some people were willing to do that. Some people were not really. Uh, some people were coerced by the state. They all had to go down there to work. So these people were involved in uh, physical work. They received uh, re-education by learning from their pe uh, learning from peasants. Uh, when they reached the uh, countryside, um, women and men actually they worked separately. Uh, they were assigned to different uh, production teams. Uh, so their the, the gender segregation at work was pretty distinct during that time. And usually it was men who got higher uh, work points and women get lower work points, just like as, as the practice we just mentioned uh, uh, within the rural communities. And, uh, and presumably uh, it's tied to, you know, physical strength uh, that makes the, the difference. And the women were seen as weaker. And that's why uh, they, uh, they got smaller points and uh, the regulation during that time is maximum women would get eight work points per day and for men they could get only 10 so uh, there is a cap even you know with that we know there are differences uh, physically some women could be much much stronger right, than men and they could uh, they have the capacity to earn 10 or even 12 but they can only receive eight uh, whereas for a lot of men, they uh, they don't want to work that much, you know. They are not that strong. They don't, but that they they uh, they still they get more points uh, than women. It's just uh, not not very fair. Uh, uh, it's unfair to women, and it's unfair to men either, in a way. Uh, so uh, about the work points regulation, uh, we could uh, quickly have a look. At, um, the clips here. Just one minute. I was in the city of 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 the 到安徽插队落户的插了有七年我六三年到新疆这边待了二十二年我们也就是说在六八年的年底十二月二十八号那天听下了非常非常大的雪那我妈妈送我到那个农村老家去插队落户一个歌曲叫满怀热望
看着我，流泪。我呢，看着他，笑着说：“回去吧，不要送了。”那我姐姐她身体也不好，我想就让她我她留在家里，我去吧。但是我母亲非常伤心，走了那么多小孩呢，她一直哭。但是我想她要伤心，我不能伤心。所以我走的时候，我自己很清楚，火车开的时候，我始终没流过泪。So there, there is another uh, short clip you could watch uh, later on, and uh, so this is the you know some of the Sandown youths, and you know, we know a president Xi Jinping, uh, he also <laughs> used to be a Sandown youth, uh, so um, he he was sent to uh, a very impoverished area in western China for about seven years. Uh, oh, let me see if you could see that clearly. Yeah, and uh, uh, that's quite an experience for him. And that experience, according to him, uh, uh, had given him a will of iron uh, in his later life. So uh, this is not bad, right? Being sent down to the countryside to work with peasants, you do, you know, learn a lot of things from them, and then you. Physically, uh, you have practiced yourself because um, you had to really eat bitterness, uh, 吃苦 uh, you need to work with them, etc., and learn from real life experiences. So that experience was pretty precious. Uh, that build up uh, President Xi today, yeah. And you can see that picture here down the bottom on the left. It shows um this is the cave dwelling that president xi jinping called home during the cultural revolution so uh he was you know handing on the cave that some of the photos uh the black and white pictures uh that uh, this one also one of them was she uh second from left of uh, this one <laughs> this one was uh president xi yeah and uh if you're interested you can click on that link to find out more about it and here uh, we need to mention other, another campaigns launched by the CCP and uh, that's Iron Girl campaign or it's called Iron Women. Uh, so um, Iron Women, I, I guess some of you, you have heard about this term, right? Iron Women, but that, that is different from, uh, uh, you know, what we call Iron Women in the West. But if you Google that, you will find you know, a completely different image, uh, like super women, uh, that uh, in, in, in the Western films, not that. It's during the Cultural Revolution that China and the state uh, set up uh, the thing called Iron Women. This is um, basically a model worker uh, promulgated, propagated by the official media. So, uh, so any characters and uh, purpose you can see from this. Uh, slide. So these are all considered iron women. So uh, they're apparently, you could see they're very masculine, right? And uh, they're strong, they're robust, they are capable of uh, performing jobs that are done by males. Uh, for example, some of them could fix high voltage electric wires like uh, this woman. Some of them they could, uh, you know, uh, they, they work in the factories and uh, some of them they, they drive uh, tractors, etc. So uh, masculine women, uh, happy women, willing to sacrifice themselves to uh, build uh, socialism and communism. Uh, these are uh, the model workers called iron women. So back to the previous slide, we could see their behaviors, their look. Uh, uh, arguably, you could see this is uh, a rejection of feminism, you say, and um, uh, but that time was pretty fashionable and uh, uh, a kind of masculine femininity during that time. And uh, eh, especially these posters were used to, you know, to tackle some of those others who were having this bourgeoisie attitudes and thoughts uh, and whoever adopted femininity during that time, the so-called, you know, capitalism and wearing skirts, for example, drawing makeup were considered very inappropriate during that time. 
and uh, that's anti-social behavior, etc. And uh, so it's very risky that time for women uh, wearing makeup or wearing skirt or high heels, high heel shoes like we do today, and even having long hair. And you do see, you know, some women were having long hair, but a lot of others when they're their long hair, they had to, you know, braid it. And they, especially during a certain period, their hair got cut. Uh, their hair got cut by the little uh, red, what was it called? Xiao Hong Wei Bing, the little red guards uh, during that time. So everything was pretty revolutionary and uh, uh, very uh, political. Uh, and women's look during that time, feminism, you can tell, is rejected. And any discussions about women's uh, problem was declared bourgeoisie. Yeah. And um, women's sexuality was prone to be attacked. Uh, so if there is no reason to attack, uh, people would uh, just simply say, you have a lifestyle problem. Uh, so women were, you know, accused of having this kind of problem. Uh, many of them, they were accused of having this problem and they were forced to wear a, uh, a string of uh, shoes around their shoulders. And uh, they were asked to parade through the street, being taunted as broken shoes, in Chinese, a very... Uh, derogatory term uh, to, 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 to describe women. And the little red guards that time were very radical, very, very radical. And uh, they just, uh, you know, a common slogan uphold by these little red guards. And you can see the pictures showing. Uh, that says times have changed women and men are the same so times have changed women and men were the same and you can see from their dress uh, they, 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 they were wearing this uh, uh, everybody wear the same color the same dress uh, and uh, women were behaving like men so uh, do you see this as a form of gender equality or do you see this as a more of a depri dep deprivation of womenhood and femininity? So this is a question to think of. Yeah. And uh, so basically everybody, including men and women, needed to demonstrate their revolutionary gesture. Uh, if you behave like a woman, then you might be labeled as a backward element so this is a very radical unique period in chinese history yeah so uh, whether that is you know women and men were really the same or arguably it's a deprivation of womanhood i think uh different person may felt differently because everybody may have different experiences and uh and, and especially given people, you know, different classes, if people of different classes, they may, you know, think differently. So there is no, you know, uh, right or wrong answers or straightforward answer to these, uh, to this question, but it's worth thinking. Yeah. And there, there is a book uh, that compiled um, a lot of essays written by uh, gender uh, a lot of essays on gender by post male Chinese literary women. So these women, uh, uh, you know, uh, were have that experience. A number of urban women, especially, they were brought up during the Maoist era and then they abandoned their middle school, high school, and college education. They serve as farmers factory workers and soldiers during the Cultural Revolution period. And once China entered the economic, economic reform era, these women, the sundown youths, were inspired by Western science and technology. They incorporate those, you know, liberal thinking, liberal thoughts, and individualism and humanism. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, is in conforming uh, to China's changing ideology during the social transition period as well. And these women realized that they 
lost their womanhood uh, and their precious time during the Maoist era. So many of them, they became uh, feminist uh, writers and they created a lot of work just recalling memories and express their personal feelings uh, that they've got during uh, the sundown, uh, you know, uh, experiences and the time they spend in rural China uh, with peasants, etc. Of course, there are good and bad. And later we are going to look at one essay written by one of the uh, feminist writer called Lu Xinger. I've attached that essay to model. I'm pretty sure some of you have already read that. It's not long. Uh, we are going to look at that essay together uh, in five minutes. Now I want to give you a break, five minutes break. We'll come back here at uh, 10.07. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, just do some stretches, walk around. Uh, it's important to move around and do some stretches uh, during this three hour block. Okay. See you in five minutes.
Hi, let's continue. Uh, I hope you're all there. Are you there? Okay. Uh, anyway, let's continue. Uh, I've got one question here from Brendan in our uh, chat box. So uh, the question is, so did women both have to work uh, and also give birth to more children uh, to uh, increase labor supply? So it seems like these two things are in conflict or was this policy revised after the Great Leap Forward? So Brendan, I think I just missed your question and now I got it. I think uh, probably you meant during the Great Leap Forward. Yes, indeed, uh, women needed to work and they needed to give birth to uh, as many children as they could. Uh, they were in conflict, yes. Uh, that's what we call women's dual burden, right? And uh, because, uh, you know, on the one hand, they need to work because they needed to echo uh, to the state's um, ideology to build socialism and communism during that time. So as a social member they need to do that and uh, they need to give more uh give birth to more children uh, yes uh, because the state needs more labor to build socialism so that's their uh, social duty uh, and uh more than that they also need to take care of the family because uh their role um, they, they are women uh, their roles are natural naturalized uh, as household workers uh kids caretakers etc and the question was this policy revised after greatly forward uh okay brendan that's not a policy yeah there is no say uh legal framework that regulates women to do this abc it is there yeah it's a hidden rule uh, and uh, so uh, obviously this is after the great leap forward this situation uh is getting better because women didn't have to uh, give birth to that many people uh, uh, and uh, especially during the opening up an economic reform uh, period things uh, started to change uh, completely and women gained um, uh, increased uh, mobility and status and uh, flexibility and more autonomy so that's all go with the shifting ideology uh, by the state Okay, yeah, I hope you, I answered your question. And uh, feel free to ask me any question, you know, throughout um, yeah, the lecture, uh, in case I missed your uh, question uh, while we, I, I, I talk. Yeah, okay, let's continue here. Uh, let's uh, look at the essay written by Luciner. That's called Women's Sameness and Difference. So why am I putting this up here, right? I think this is um, useful for us to look at, you know, because uh, this is something that you could use as a sample for your self-interpretation task. If people wanted to do a commentary, you know, on a certain thing, just on a slogan like this, uh, women's sameness and difference, and you can do that, right? And currently, you know, there are different kinds of slogans uh, you know, made by the state or by any others, you know, that you got from the news or, or anything, and you can do that. You can you can reflect on that and you can include the discussion of history we discussed and then um, you can present your views. So this is this article provides a sample for us. Uh, so let's do that together. What I want us to do is you use the pen I'm not sure if you could annotate. Are you able to annotate this slide? You should, right? Just uh, highlight the arguments in this essay. Yeah, because when James and I are marking your self-reflection or self-interpretation on any task, we need to, you know, we're looking for the arguments that you present in, uh, in your uh, essay, yeah? So let's do it and uh, let's both read that. Let's spend around um, seven minutes on this article and get it done, yeah. So uh, use your uh, pen to annotate. I wanna, 
I want you to highlight the argument. And I can read that for you. We can do that together. Uh, while I read, you underline. Okay. So women often complain that being a woman is truly worrisome. I can relate to the complaint. Women are worn out, not only physically, but also mentally and emotionally. I think we can do that together. So uh, I read the first paragraph. Why don't you do, you read uh, the later paragraphs and while well, people can highlight the argument. So next, who, who, who's reading the paragraph next? Should I call you randomly or you volunteer? Read it. Okay, thank you. Who is this? Uh, Stephanie. Stephanie, yep, yeah. great. Second. Since, since we were young girls, we have learned the truth. Women are half the sky and women and men are the same. As slogans, these words roll out from the tips of our tongues. We felt proud and inspired. We, were trans we transformed these words into actions to become as capable and smart as men. They were Iron Girl Troops, 8th of March Conductor Groups, Women Pilots, and so on. In all walks of life, women performed as well as men, to say the least, and did whatever men were able to do. It was a common belief that women advanced at the same pace as that of men. The catchphrase, men and women are the same, was reinforced repeatedly for so many years that it became a universally accepted worldview. The phrase was also supposed to signify a, a historical change, Chinese women's liberation. Great. Thanks very much. And now let's move on. Who is reading next paragraph? <clears throat> Come on. Oh, well, I can read. Yeah. Uh, who is this? Uh, Joy. Joy. Yeah. Let's do it. Mm. However, I beg to differ. Continue. Things in the world are different because of their different natures. The motto, men and women are the same. In fact, only set requirements on women without asking men to do what women do. Bring up children with patience. Taking care of horse calls without complaints and the caring for the parents of both families is devotion. Indeed, these slogans has encouraged women to make as many public contributions as men do. At the same time, however, women have done many things that men do not do. In this respect, the slogan of sameness is biased because it requires female to be both women and men. It force women into taking in more responsibility. In reality, women and men are not the same. Great. Thank you, Joy. And let's continue. Next one. Next paragraph. Anyone? Come on, just read. Time is tickling. Ah, time. Come on, it's ticking. So uh, let's let's get a volunteer to read. <clears throat> it's not hard. Come on. Shall I call you randomly? Okay, Brendan. <clears throat> you there, Brendan? What about Carmen? Carmen? Hey? Fijian? Are you all there? I'm wondering if people are there. And uh, I can read it. who is this? Uh, Karina. Karina? Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, the decades. Louder. 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 Yeah, I can't hear you very well. Following the decades, is that okay, my voice? Uh, louder, yeah. A bit louder. Mm. <clears throat> Following the decades, long beliefs in sameness, things and situations have changed along with economic reforms. Men have also liberated themselves in terms of desires and needs rephrasing at the same time what they demand from women. No longer emphasizing sameness, they have created a new com campaign cry, 
females must behave like women to be attractive. In essence, the cry indicates that men demand that women return to tradition to be different from men. It is even applauded as a symbol of women, uh, Chinese women's progress. Okay, thank you. And uh, move on. Next paragraph. Let's get somebody else. Yeah, I'll read it. Yep, let's go. Who is this? Xijia. Xijia, yep. Yes, Please. I do not agree with this idea either. When sameness is emphasized, women and men are actually not the same. When difference is emphasized, women still must work as much as men in addition to domestic responsibilities. No wonder women are worn out by such a hard, wearsome life. If they want to shield themselves from male, from male contempt, they must keep the sameness. And if, if they want to appeal the men's sexual desires, they must maintain the difference. These demands are too unfair, too much for women. Besides, ill to sameness and difference is almost impossible to um, accomplish all at once through women's efforts along without certain favorable uh, economic conditions. This is hard mission to accomplish. Indeed, the slogan men and women are the same has allowed women chances to evaluate uh, to e elevate, mm. elevate their sorry to elevate their social and economic positions. They cry, men and women are different to some degree. Offers some way for women to enhance their integrity. integrity. The problem is that women's libera liberation in the name of sameness and women's progress through difference both subject women to men's requirements. Why doesn't why doesn't male-dominated society also require men to liberate themselves from the traditional thinking to make progress at the same time? I believe that behind the catchwords sameness and difference, there are some there are some deep-rooted deep problems. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Now, you right. see, this essay is um, pretty short, right? And uh, it presented a uh, these arguments by the feminist writer so uh and i have highlighted some of uh, the arguments made by the author and um, feel free to you know use different colors to highlight and to you know uh, to let us know uh, what else needs to be paid attention to and uh, let me ask you what do you think about this uh essay just simply you know um uh, uh, arguing uh, you know, simply analyzing the slogan, women's sameness and uh, difference. Uh, what women and, women and men are the same, basically. This is uh, arguing against uh, the slogan, men and women are the same. What do people think? Do you think what the author, you know, argued makes sense to you? As we just, uh, you know, outlined what gender and gender relations and uh you know the gender nature of work during the Maoist era and uh, before we move on to the economic reform era and what do people think about the essay written by this feminist writer who used to be a um, sundown youth I think she made a really good point about um, women and men are still not equal because when men are not um, expected to do the same work, such as housework, bringing up children, being a parent figure. Mm. Yes. So the gender inequalities, uh, that's the, the author was trying to highlight, right? Even, you know, you say women and men were the same. They were not actually the same. And uh, more than that, uh, uh, women shouldered more work, uh, more burden uh, than men. So this slogan just, uh, you know, uh, it's just uh, 
politically motivated trying to mobilize women into the workforce, but uh, without really thinking much for, uh, you know, for, for uh, the interests of women. Yeah. So whichever way that you can put, uh, so uh, now we understand how to write, you know, just a short essay on a slogan. Uh, if you want to do any slogan analysis, feel free to do it. Now let's move on to uh, the next stage, which is the economic reef. Oh, no, not yet. Oh, not yet. Okay. So now let's uh, have a look at the um, the work unit uh, during uh, the Maoist era and uh, till even till today. Okay. And uh, let me just uh, make that bigger for you. Okay. Okay. So done way. I think we're very familiar with the term especially for those who come from China, right? So work unit is done late, but we're talking about done late uh, from the 1950s and uh, moving on to that today. We'll focus on the done late in the past. So what is a work unit in, ca in case people don't know? So done late emerged from the 1950s. It's a basic social organization in China. Institutionally, it is very, very powerful uh, that influenced uh, uh, that plays a uh, you know heavy influence on people's everyday life, and uh, Denle uh, is uh, the main center of employment and social social security for urban residents. We're talking about urban residents, not rural residents. Okay, and uh, Denle adopts an, a model that's called the uh, Iron Rice Ball, Tie Fan Ban. Uh, so. Uh, that means when you get that job, you won't lose it. You will, you know, work, um, you know, uh, on that. You will have that position forever, for a lifetime. So this is a model adopted by Dan Lei during that time. And China no longer adopts this model uh, because, well, you know, given the competition nowadays, and we all have to compete for a job, and we're not uh, assigned uh, any job automatically. But in the past, uh, that's the model adopted by the state. When you think about that, it's pretty good, right? <laughs> but uh, we don't have that benefit today. And each downway creates its own housing, childcare, schools, clinics, shops, services, and post offices. It's very powerful. It has all resources needed. Uh, uh, however, the power of Dunway started to uh, get weaker and weaker from the new millennium. And uh, so why Dunway is very uh, gendered social organization? Because yeah, um, at Dunway, there were, you know, uh, the work was pretty uh, segregated in terms of uh, uh, the obligations and in terms of duties. Uh, there are light industry and uh, heavy industry. So uh, whoever get that strength, physical strength, will work in the heavy industry and uh, mining, like metal processing, those. And uh, for women, usually work for uh, the light industry, uh, doing some, uh, you know, the craft work. And uh, these are all tied to work remuneration. And you can tell at this stage, it's, it's a continuation from uh, the Maoist uh, model, right? The heavy industry, the light industry, everything was pretty segregated in terms of gender roles. And uh, the work allegation for men and women were sexually biased. For example, men usually get this uh, skill-related work, whereas women's uh, work do not uh, really require a lot of skills. For example, men usually, they were doing work that designing wool patterns they use their brain to design wool pattern however women just uh, the ones who knit the clothes uh, based on men's design is very common and you can tell who get paid more than who who uh, obviously men get paid more because they <laughs> they have this intellectual contribution to this kind of work whereas women they were laborers and for chinese male shop assistants Okay, if you see a Chinese male shop assistant during that time, people would, uh, you know, gossip because uh, they thought, okay, that is uh, women's work. And why the hell a man was doing a, you know, a job like a male shop assistant? So this will, you know, raise 
uh, eyebrows during that time. And in terms of promotion during that period, uh, men were usually prioritized for upward mobility. That means uh, if you think about a triangle uh, down the top, that's cadre. Cadre uh, means the, the local political leaders. They were usually males. And then um, in the middle, you have those uh, uh, high, you know, relatively higher ranked positions. They're all dominated by males. And these is all supervised uh, you know, by males as well. Whereas there are women, uh, women usually down the bottom of the triangle, uh, but for those women who are capable, they did uh, work as supervisors, but they work as group supervisors rather than uh, workplace supervisors. So comparatively, comparatively speaking, it's lower ranked. Uh, and uh, women cadres were, you know, suspected to, to uh, got their position uh, because they relied on men uh, and uh, men work in female dominant industries find it very easy to rise up to cadres the top position and uh, so it's very very gendered practice at Dunway uh, in terms of promotion in terms of uh, uh, collegiality you know the, the work uh, relations etc in terms of mobility, it's usually male party members, uh, they get more work um, mobility. They get more chances than women to be promoted. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, in terms of uh, party membership, uh, it's usually, uh, uh, you know, acquired by men rather than uh, by women. And uh, this is associated with awards promotion, repetition, etc. So if you work, if you say uh, you work Excel and uh, people recognize your work, then uh, you get promoted and you can get party membership. Uh, and it's, 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 a, it's a symbolic capital basically for individuals to become a party member. And I can still recall when I was little, when I was in China and um, in our class, right? And um, the class was, uh, you know, trying to choose around five or six people out of 50 to become, um, you know, party, to, to have this party membership. And uh, I volunteered, you know, but I wasn't chosen. And I was pretty sad uh, because this is based on academic merits <laughs> and uh, for me academically uh, you know I wasn't <clears throat> in the top 10 of my class so I lost that opportunity so party membership was um, it's a symbolic capital for individuals everybody wanted that yeah and uh, so it's usually male who got that but in my class there were women uh, there were a lot of males too uh, but in in the past, during the 1950s, uh, it's more gender uh, segregated in terms of these promotion thing and symbolic capital acquirement thing. Yeah, and uh, moving on to the next slide. So Guanxi at Dunlei uh, is a very important thing. So what is Guanxi? Guanxi is um, a type of relationship connection and this is a, a form of social capital uh, and this links to promotion and training opportunities that's why Guanzi is so important here is a video I'll just uh, play that uh, quick and you can show and you can see what is uh, Guanzi yeah and why Guanzi is so important it's not only in China is important it's um, the Chinese everywhere. and Guanzi Guanxi is one of the most overhyped and least understood words used in relation to doing business with the Chinese. At the same time, Guanxi defines the world Chinese people live in, so it's a critically important concept for anyone who's dealing with them. Although Guanxi is usually translated as connections or relationships, the concept carries strong overtones of influence and mutual obligation. Guanxi is tied to certain Confucian values and therefore carries special cultural significance in China. At its most basic level, Guanxi is about relationships. 
everyone just finds it easier to deal with people they already know. What's substantially different for the Chinese is that they see relationships as having a heavy dose of mutual obligation. It's not only good to do favors for your family and friends, you owe it to them to do those favors. Once he also shares the Western meaning of influence or pull. This is especially true in business, where knowing the right people can significantly influence whether or not things get done. Quantity is far more important than rules or laws, and to some extent forms the basic guidelines for how Chinese people behave. It's often hard for Westerners to understand how important and pervasive quantity is in the lives of Chinese people, how it touches on things no Westerner would guess at. For instance, in the West, it wouldn't be uncommon for relationships to determine where someone bought a car or from whom they purchased a house. But in China, it would also not be uncommon for guanxi to determine where someone buys their vegetables or from whom they purchase shoelaces. This pervasiveness can have some surprising effects. For instance, when a senior person in a Chinese company rises or falls in the organization, dozens, sometimes hundreds of people will adjust their behavior, not only towards that person but towards each other, depending on how they think this impacts their network of obligations. And the adjustments can be surprising. Someone who believes they benefit from the change may feel obliged to be nicer and more agreeable to a colleague they dislike, in order to reflect well on the senior person that got promoted. Or, they may feel that this relieves them of the obligation to act nicely, because the senior person will protect them. This can be incredibly frustrating for non-Chinese people, who are mostly unaware that these things are even happening. Rules become secondary to these massively subtle and complicated calculations about who is obliged to whom. To most Westerners, these issues seem irrelevant, even illegitimate. But for Chinese people, this is exactly the world that they live in. I'm C.T. Johnson. So, guanxi is very important. Yeah, and、uh, if you think about Guanxi and the cadre, the top、uh, leaders at your workplace, so cadres are the targets for whom who want to have Guanxi. So if you want to, you know, climb up the ladder in your workplace, you need to form a very close and good relations with the cadre. And who are the ones who can form that relationship? It's usually males, men who are mostly higher ranked. They find it easier to meet cadres, talk to them. Whereas for women, they are, you know, as they are already、uh, lower ranked,、uh, it's very hard for them to build that network and to create this guanxi. Now I have a question at this point: How can you move up the social ladder here? I mean, promotion at workplace without having guanxi at workplace. I want you to have a think. I'm going to give you one minute just to think. How? You do not have guanxi, right? But you want to move up the social ladder. What can you do? Maybe great versus scale.、Uh, yeah. Sam, say that again. I can. I, what I can hear is the the sound of bubbles. I don't know what what's、okay. there.、Uh, the the great versus scale. Skills, right? To demonstrate your talents. Yes, that's good. Yeah. So、uh, just to showcase your talents, your skills, to perform well, use your performance to, you know, persuade your,、uh, you know, cadres or workplace or supervisors, and then you can climb the ladder. Good. That's one. Yeah. Are there other ways? Well, I guess you could contribute more to your workplace. Uh, you know, as you know, the Chinese society relies more heavily on the system of、uh, meritocracy. So,、uh, for example, if you are watching,、uh, working in a big、uh, corporate, you could、uh, get a promotion by bringing、uh, business cases. You、mm-hmm. know. 
Yes, Zongzi. Yeah, that's very similar to what Sam said. Yes, good performance is important. And you mentioned the term meritocracy. Yeah, that's um, that's good. Yeah, nowadays it is like that. But in the 1950s, meritocracy, you can put a question mark there, but it, it does work. I'm not saying it's it's not important. It, it is uh, working, but Guanxi <laughs> at the same time is um, much more important. Uh, in, in a way, uh, 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 than uh, in comparison with meritocracy, but meritocracy indeed is important as well. Yeah, and uh, and uh, so that's basically one point. Good performance. Are there other ways? I'm looking for people's answers. Especially for women. A marriage. Okay, good. What about it? Marry whom? You could marry to someone who are at a higher position with more power. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, you can move up within the power hierarchy by marrying someone at a higher position or having more power. Good. Yeah, that's another way. And uh, another way is... Uh, women could capitalize on connections with the way there are NATO family members, uh, mostly through fathers. So uh, this to create this con you know thing called guanxi. Yeah, thanks very much for people's contribution. And uh, next one is the thing is when people mention good performance, right? I'm not denying that. As you mentioned, meritocracy, yes, is very important. However, the thing is is often associated with rumor. Uh, that will incur work workplace gossip if you're, especially for women, performing really well and uh, climbing up the ladder and became cadres. Say, if a woman uh, performs so well and then she become the cadre of the workplace. In that situation, people would gossip. So, for example, a quote here that says, at that time, in the dumb way, I had good relation with my leader. Others talked blindly gossiping without evidence they spread it around how good i was with the leader but i didn't care so this is the you know obviously this is the woman who was promoted but seeing you know the promotion that women had others would gossip this is uh, really not fair but for men if they got promoted people will gossip less or there would be no gossip at all so uh, this is another thing uh you know social surveillance of um women's sexuality uh, could constrain uh, them to obtain guanxi and to climb up the social ladder and even they they perform really well people will question that and that is a social pressure uh created on gender yeah so guanxi overall was a male network it's a very gendered social resource during that time and uh, there are other uh, gendered practice at Dunley as well. For example, uh, marriage matchmaking, housing allocation, surveillance of family life, and family planning. And uh, let me just uh, go that uh, go through that uh, quickly one by one. So when I talk, when I uh, mention uh, marriage matchmaking, uh, what I mean is it's a very Marriage matchmaking is a very popular activity in workplace culture in the 1950s and 70s, uh, 60s. Yeah, uh, from leaders to ordinary workers, they were very busy, you know, trying to marry off the young, especially when they saw their young female colleagues uh, in their uh, late 20s. Uh, they would think, oh, it's time. Uh, for for her to get married and uh, so that's why matchmaking practice can affect relationship between colleagues and between leaders and subordinates so uh, you can see from this dialogue uh, that um, you know it says did any leaders introduce someone to you and the person says there's one leader trying to set me up with his friend but i didn't agree and when you read the following uh thing and then you realize and uh, the person the women the young women who actually got pressure uh from being setting up um, by his uh supervisor um 
you know, so uh, this, uh, he, she, you know, had to, she, she wanted to say no, but it's really difficult for her to say no, as that from her supervisor. And this thing, this practice is pretty unique in China, and that is rooted in traditional Confucian culture. And uh, uh, for people who, you know, were, were born here, you probably wouldn't, you know, understand why. Uh, because unmarried women over 25 in China was seen as old single girl, uh, not yet, you know, left over women during that time. But, um, you know, people just thought this is weird if women, when they reach 25 or 27, they're still not getting married. Yeah. So, um, this is another kind of social pressure, you know, on gender. But for men, they didn't face that pressure, but just for women. Uh, and uh, so single men were tolerated, but not for single women. Yeah. For in terms of housing allocation by Dan Lei, housing allocation was very scarce, uh, very scarce resources uh, during that time. And, and I still nowadays so male workers were prioritized to receive housing allocation whereas for for, for women it's difficult and um, it's always uh, male workers get prioritized in terms of allocation of housing uh, many women also they were living at um, the housing provided by their husband's work unit so single men were often offered dormitory by their Danle upon application, whereas women had to stay home with their parents. And you can see this gendered uh, allocation of housing reflect traditional uh, dependency of women, uh, reinforced uh, the traditional dependency of women on their husbands. So all of these are a structural problem. You can see why gender, everything is gendered. Uh, why, where are the inequalities coming from? This is all structural. You can trace that to the structural problem. Yeah, for example, like Dan Wei, right? Okay, the next one is a uh, surveillance of family life. It said that Dan Wei was a very, very powerful social unit. It um, watches over people's domestic life uh, and maintaining harmony and social stability. So this is a very um, unique in China. Uh, in the West, like in Australia, you wouldn't imagine there is something called a work unit that watches over your private life. But in China, uh, in the earlier days, it was like that. And uh, if female workers complain, their husbands uh, were having extramarital affairs, were, you know, trying to cheat them. And the work unit would uh, say, if your husband is someone outside the family, you must examine yourself carefully. Yeah. If you try your best to be a good wife, then he's less likely to turn someone else. And you can see the response from Dan Wei toward their female uh, workers were very, uh, you know, biased as well. This is all standing from a male's perspective. This is called um, patriarchal, uh, patriarchal operation uh, of everyday life. Yeah, this is just one example. Yeah, there are many, many examples. Yeah. And here, uh, in terms of family planning, is also very gendered. Uh, we talked about family planning last week. So Dan Wei, what you know, what role does Dan Wei have? Uh, work unit complies to. Uh, the government's one-child policy to control the population. And when you control the population, right, you are controlling over women's bodies. Think it's the women's bodies that undergo all those imposed process, examination and forced abortion and uh, obstetric services, etc. The state wouldn't think that is women's body. They just think you know, for the big picture, it's um, important to control the policy for the economy. Yeah. Uh, so the Chinese media at that time was also propagating the idea that uh, personal sacrifice for a healthy nation uh, are, um, you know, very important and very necessary. You know, this all these campaigns that prompt women, they, uh, they have to go through these sacrifices. And uh, 
of course, there are also cultural preference to boys uh, rather than, uh, than girls. And this is not new. Uh, so in most of families, girls are uh, uh, not really preferred. You know, in my family too. Uh, I know, you know, the time when my family gave birth to me, they wanted a boy. Uh, my father wanted a boy. Ridiculous, right? And uh, and my uh, my grand uh, my grandparents uh, in my father's side, and they also wanted a boy. So it's very common, very common in the 1970s and 80s, especially, and especially the one child policy enhanced that preference uh, of boys, and that's much much more stronger in rural China. As said, um, in rural China, labor. Uh, uh, it's very important uh, that will determine a family's uh, economic uh, earning uh, in, inside the family. Okay, so uh, this is just some quotes uh, saying uh, China gets that strong preference uh, uh, for, for boys rather than girls. Yeah, and uh, so uh, this is um, surveillance of family life uh, and, the, and the family planning. Um, also, um, women, uh, what I also want to say is women could be empowered by the one child policy as well. We can't really blame everything. We can't blame uh, saying everything bad about the one child policy. We, we need to think about the positive side as well, because women uh, were asked to bear only one child. They earned the time, they gained the time. Uh, to do their own stuff, right? They uh, they didn't have to keep bearing children until they have a son because there's one child policy, right? Okay, now uh, burden on women. Women continue to shoulder dual roles um, for families and for for work. Many of the women they had to do three shifts per day uh, during the earlier time. And uh, it's very, very, very difficult for them, especially when the work unit, they, they set up this exam uh, thing. They, uh, they ask their staff to, uh, if they want to be promoted, if they want to get a pay rise, they have to pass uh, an exam. Uh, that means uh, if women want to climb up the ladder, be promoted, it's uh, much more difficult because they got no leisure time to do the exam. They need to take their family. Whereas for men, they gain that time to prepare for this. And it's easier for, for them to rise in the workplace. And um, so these are all, you know, inequalities we could see entrenched in this uh, structure uh, built up by the state. Um, although the government, uh, you know, was promoting egalitarian work culture, uh, saying both men and women should be equal. But this is all on the surface level. But if you look closer, uh, it really shows, you know, there are different types of gender inequalities there at workplace. And that reinforced that the traditional gender roles, actually, right? On all of these work to maintain this gender hierarchy at workplace and leave women very limited space for career advancement and uh, this is the thing we need to know okay now let's move on to the second part uh, on the reform era and the reform era now let's um, take another break let's um, rest for uh, six minutes and come back uh, come back at around uh, 10 58 uh, before 11 Okay, now have some water, stretch your body again, and uh, then we'll continue. Oops.
Okay, shall we continue? Let's continue with the reform era. So we've talked about the male era. We're talking about, you know, the gender during male, the cultural revolution, the great leap forward, and the um, Dunway, the work unit. And now we're looking at the reform era that's from uh, the 1970s uh, after uh, onwards. So from uh, the mid 1970s, a large number of the Sandown youths, Shangshan Xia, Xiangdan Piqing Nian, Sandown youths, returned to the city. So um, as they returned to the city, they needed jobs, right? What could they do? Those people turned into youth waiting to be employed. And there were 16 million of them, uh, one six million of them. So uh, that's a lot, right? So they had to wait for years to be assigned for a job. And um, they, uh, they kept waiting uh, because of this labor surplus work unit uh, became very selective because those, you know, sundown youths, they need jobs. When they go for employment, they find there is not much job available, uh, not many jobs available. So in that case, the work unit became very selective. They tend to prioritize men rather than women. Uh, they set up exams and some of them even ask for higher exam scores uh, from women uh, rather than for men in order to you know, prioritize males. So this is very, um, you know, this kind of a gender discrimination you could see uh, ever since the earlier time. And uh, many simply just, uh, say, reviews hire women uh, and uh, they have different excuses. And you can think why, because uh, they think women were not uh, physically stronger. They couldn't handle the job well and women would incur extra cost and uh, and it's um, women have family duties, uh, so uh, that will compromise their work. So all of these reasons uh, considered by Dunway and con considered by work unit, um, that's why uh, Dunway uh, did not want to hire women, uh, but uh, prioritize men instead. And uh, for women who can't really find jobs in the state sector, they had to work in small, uh, individual, uh, individually run prices, and uh, many of them were marginalized in the workplace. Uh, one example here is in Jiangsu province during the 1970s, the Labor Bureau announced that 351 new workers needed to be recruited for uh, several enterprises, and that further specified 270 recruits would be male and only 82 females. And you can see the demand for males largely exceed that for uh, female workers. And uh, in the 1990s, the state launched this thing called state, uh, sorry, in the 1990s, state-owned enterprises were under reform. Um, so driven by accelerated marketization and privatization, state-owned enterprises during that time were bleeding financially. They uh, were not very... Uh, competitive in comparison with many of the non-state sectors. So think during that time, competition increased, right? Privatization, globalization, all companies needed to compete uh, for, um, uh, compete with each other in order to gain a share in the market. So for state-owned owned enterprises, and they, they are not very competitive. That's why they became losers. Uh, and many of them during this time, they had to lay off workers. Uh, so who are the ones who were the targets? Women. Uh, women were the ones. So a very gendered layoff happened during that time that women became targets. Uh, the, there were some statistics, statistics uh, really, uh, that says, um, 70 out of 71 cities that uh, women constitute, uh, 63% of late of workers. 
62 percent that's um more than males yeah and at the same time they count uh they only account for less than 39 percent of the total urban force yeah you don't have to memorize these statistics but these numbers uh tell us the layoff uh the redundancy everything is very very gendered uh, and uh yep so and you're now wondering why women are targeted why that's gendered uh, uh here are some reasons because women tend to have lower skills than men we've mentioned this earlier they have lower job status they have very little network uh with the top cadres and they have um limited guanxi network um and the employers were thinking women were costly and they have family duties etc and that's why women became the target uh, and when women get pregnant uh, as according to an employer uh, they will get pre pregnant right which uh, the employer says i mean i have to pay her for a holiday etc oh gosh uh, pay for a holiday uh, to give birth and take care of the baby so these are all seen as burdens to employers which created high gender inequalities at workplace during that time and uh when this happened uh, the negative impact on women will just keep accumulating because the late of workers were likely to experience downward occupational mobility that means if uh, women they get laid off at workplace it's very difficult for them to find another job yeah and uh, so uh, they're you know they're just uh, keep going down and down and down and uh, once they don't have job they do more family duties and that will give them less time uh, to get prepared for a new role so this is just like a vicious circle for women uh, and it's really hard for them to get reemployed, and they tend to get depressed. Uh, all of these were intertwined. And uh, so, overall, if you think whether women's status has improved or not during the 1990s, we really need to take into account the state owned enterprises restructuring and some of the structural problems uh you know created by the state so just briefly women's status in the labor market post state-owned enterprises restructuring has uh, deteriorated yeah and uh this one is about what what is this one this is uh okay um at workplace women also face gender discrimination yeah so uh what are the types of gender discrimination there uh, women have higher risks in terms of uh, having the below things uh, first one they have less employment opportunities in comparison with males and uh, this is related to you know the education level uh the preference by the uh, employers etc and some of the factors we mentioned earlier and uh they tend to get in, unemployed because they were the targets for layoff uh when when it's um uh, when these things happen and it's very difficult for them to get jobs again uh, and uh they have very low skills they tend to have downward occupational mobility lower go down lower and lower they get less pay uh they work longer hours more housework and they also you know encounter sexual harassment more than men and uh they also retire earlier i think it's five years younger uh in comparison with men and women get smaller pension than men and there's income inequality as well yeah so uh, uh at this stage if you could um, you know if you have looked at the attachments and the links that i put in moodle you'll see i um i put i think one was about uh, the female labor participation I can, I can i can get it for you let me check um right. 
So if you look at model, if we look at women's participation in the world, you will see women in China, actually their labor participation it's pretty high in comparison with a lot of other countries and china has one of asia's asia pacific's highest labor force participation uh, and uh, let me get it for you so in week three in week three you'll see i put feminist writer lu xinger's essays there and uh, China's first uh, gender discriminatory lawsuit. This is something we'll be talking about later. And this link, labor force, female percentage of labor force. If you click on that, uh, let's click on this. You'll see that will lead us to this page that shows women's labor participation uh, in China. So now you could see from 1990s is here and uh, it is very high uh, if you compare with other countries as said china has one of asia pacific's highest labor force participation however uh, I'm, I'm talking about females okay however the percentage of female labor participation started to decline from the 1990s see you see the trend is going down, right? And if you see now, uh, it's it's not yet um, till 2020 yet. What you could imagine is it's keep going down. It keeps going down because during COVID, right? At this moment, the layoff at workplace is very gendered as well. We have talked about that in week one a lot of women they lost their jobs because they were working you know in the hospitality industry in the service sector and and it's covid just a you know it's under covid situation it's, it's these people uh they were affected mostly strong strong uh, in comparison with um other groups of uh, uh people and uh, here is a list of that you could see uh, comparison that shows the trend of a female labor participation in the job market. Uh, you see many of the countries they're actually going up, but in China from the 1990, from the 1990s is going down. Uh, that's largely due to the uh, state-owned enterprises restructuring. Okay, now let's get back to this slide here. Hmm. We are here in the opening up period. Yeah, so do take a look at the links that I send each week and uh, the short articles uh, that I touched uh, in each week as well. Yeah, and uh, let me ask you at this stage, are there any stories around you that you could share about gender layoff during the COVID situation that you have heard that you you know, ob observed gendered layoff, perhaps at the moment. Do you know any stories that you want to share with us? As we see, you know, female participation, labor participation keeps going down. Remember that line. And I say in 2020, it's going down even uh, lower so any stories to share that you heard that you know the people around you you don't have to mention the name just tell that anonymously without mentioning people's names. As we're talking about gender in China, in China, I'm wondering, many of them, uh, many of us uh, are in China, right? 
For people in China, have you heard any stories about gender layoff at the moment due to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic? Not yet. Okay. So uh, no stories. That's okay. If there is no story, there's no story. Yeah. And uh, this chart just shows us the gender pay gap, uh, the gender pay gap that reveals uh, the gender pay gap in different countries. So uh, as you can see uh, in this picture, obviously men uh, get paid more than women. Uh, women, the yellow represents women, gray represents men. Women in comparison with men. Women's salary is around 60% of males. And this situation here, you can see just out of these countries, China is doing okay, right? In comparison with the developed countries. Yeah, like in Canada, it's 62%, and UK, 66 and US, 64 And all these uh, are telling us the gender pay gap is a universal problem. Right? It's not just uh, in China, but it's universal. And uh, for people who are interested in gender pay gap, you can find more details online. You can find more, uh, more data, especially data released by the United Nations. You'll be able to find a lot. And for now, uh, this one is women warriors and self-sacrificing daughters. I wrote an article on that and uh, that will be published uh, by the ANU Press uh, in its ebook that will come next year but if that comes earlier I'll share with you uh, but for now uh, let, let's just uh, have a look at the thing that I um, you know I touched on so this is um, during COVID-19 I think when you see these images ah, some people may suddenly realize okay I have watched that Right. And um, some of you may not know. Let me just show you the link first. Yeah, let's just watch that. This is um, the women nurses during the COVID-19, their contributions uh, during the pandemic. I need sound. Yeah. frontline nurses during the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, this is a video uh, tweeted by China Xinhua News. It says coronavirus fighting nurses cut hair short before heading to Wuhan to aid the battle against the pandemic. Yeah, the epidemic during that time. So what we could see is um, these women, uh, they uh, shave their hair and uh, they work on the front line. And uh, even if you see the second image, uh, do, do you know who this one is? This is a pregnant woman still keeping working at the front line. Let me ask people, do you know who this woman is? Who's this lady? Pregnant, but still working at the COVID-19 front line in Wuhan. Anybody knows? No, at least you should know her name because she's a hero, right? Her name is Zhao Yu. Uh, okay, Zhao Yu. So these women, they are really, you know, warriors, self-sacrificing daughters, uh, if you want to call that. However, you know, despite their, you know, heroic, heroic efforts during this pandemic, they are still disadvantaged 
in China's health and the medical industry. Because women healthcare workers, if you look up data, they earn only 60% of their um, male counterparts. Yeah, and this is unfair, right? And um, you do see a lot of criticism of these um, two videos and they're saying that's just a propaganda. So here, I don't wanna say this is just a propaganda. I think um, it really, this is, um, you know, important thing that people need to know. It's not just a for pr promote, you know, promoting this idea of sacrificing, but it does have an element of that. Uh, but what people criticizing, is uh, they, they, they're saying, you know, you, you shouldn't have pregnant women working at the front line and uh, why men are not cutting their, you know, shaving their hair, but just women, uh, why you're just using women to uh, motivating, you know, this kind of spirit and morale, etc. This is controversial, uh, anyhow. And uh, that video on Zhao Yu, uh, was removed from the internet, uh, was censored. Uh, well, after the government received uh, those kind of criticism and uh, interrogation from people on social media. Okay. And uh, moving on, the other thing that you need to know is the first gender discrimination lawsuit in China. So, uh, um i have um uploaded this file to moodle i want you to have a look and i want people to tell me the story just bri briefly using your own words what's the story about now instead of me telling you uh, line by line i want to give you five minutes maximum just read that short article on china's first gender discrimination lawsuit yeah, and then tell me what's that about. Five minutes. <clears throat> The last document, just this one. You should have uh, finished reading the article. Can someone just tell us what's the story? <clears throat> um, can I just ask a question? Oh, yeah, um, mm, Steph, yeah. Just so I can understand it. So the principal said that the school doesn't discriminate, but the school's HR department 
did in this instance? Is that what he's saying? Yeah, basically the girl wanted that job, but that job advertised is only for males. And uh, so that's according to the HR department. Yeah, so in the end, uh, the girl got really upset and then took uh, the, uh, the, the, the company to the court, to the local court. It's just the, you know, the advertisement made by the HR department. It sounds like, um, that sounds like a weak excuse to me. And like the principal of the entire school should know what their HR department is putting out there. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's the, uh, the how the, uh, the thing operates within that school that we didn't know. Yeah. I think there is um, probably, you know, put it positively, a miscommunication between these two. But in actual fact, it may not be just a miscommunication, but it could be done on purpose. Yeah, it could be the principal's idea, who knows. Mm. But when the principal faces the public, obviously the principal wouldn't just to tell the truth, uh, despite there's an apology, right? <laughs> okay, so what do people think about the case? I think there are there are problems in uh, gender inequality. Like people think it's granted, but like some people they take granted for they believe that some jobs are more like some jobs they are only to be offered for boys, not girls. I mean that's discrimination. Mm. However, some people they take it for granted. Like I feel sorry for the girl in the story. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. not only the school. But also some government, like some government advertising, they said we only want to hire boys, not girls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, this is before China's law uh, on, gen on gender discrimination at workplace. Yeah, so um, this is the, the time that happened before. And uh, so uh, that, I think there is a reason for that. And... Uh, uh, but at the same time, we also need to see the positive side of the story, right? And anybody else? Let me check with people's opinion and to see what people think. And before I share with you my opinion on this story, on this case. So remember, you know, there, there are two sides. For, for, for each thing. And uh, so there's pros and cons, yeah. Other people's comments, thoughts on this, on this small case? This could be a case study that you're doing, you know, for your presentation. This is a very good case. But you don't do this, right? You don't repeat what I do. And uh, similar stories, uh, you can find a lot. But for me, you know, I think uh, the story just tells us women are growing increasingly impatient to tolerate gender discrimination in recent years. Isn't that a good sign? Right? So, uh, so uh, you could see uh, this has become China's first workplace gender discrimination lawsuit that is you know a milestone that's good yeah and uh, in the end the women got compensated uh, initially she demanded five thousand uh or or, or fifty thousand and then i think she got paid uh thirty thousand so the and an apology so that solved that problem uh, which is a good thing overall yeah, but apparently this reflects a social problem. Uh, as uh, Joy just mentioned, this is um, discrimination, right, against a women at workplace. And uh, people take that for granted. Employers take that for granted. Yeah. And uh, this is another uh, example that shows you uh, workplace discrimination this is uh china's tech giant 
Baidu's uh, job advertisement in 2017, right? So uh, you could see uh, here job requirements. Let me give a pen. Job requirements, associate's degree or above, and men. <laughs> Any major, blah, blah, blah. So this is, we could see, this is a form of gender discrimination. Uh, this is a job advertisement by Baidu, and this is crazy, right? And that happened in 2017, uh, only just three years ago. And that means gender discrimination remains very strong, and China remains very patriarchal, yeah? Uh, so uh, that's um, that example. So the government, you know, has done something, really. Uh, but so the China Employment Promotion Law, okay. So China, the Chinese government has um, done something to solve this problem. Uh, they uh, implement this uh, China Employment Promotion Law in, uh, no, 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 no. What you could see is um, the Employment Promotion Law was, uh, you know, affected, was it in 2008? Let me see, in, in 2008. Uh, and, uh, and that gender case was in 2017, uh, right? 2017 the Baidu's uh, biased uh, advertisement and then China's uh, first gender uh, discrimination lawsuit was in 2012. But the employment promotion law became effective in 2008. Obviously, uh, this, you know, the, these are all against what the government have already put in place. Uh, so even there is a law there, People are not following that, yeah. And uh, in this uh, China Employment Promotion Law, it has clearly prohibited against the discrimination on the grounds of ethnicity, race, gender, and religious belief. But in actual fact, what you could see is even after uh, five years or so, uh, things still uh, are not doing. People are not still doing the right thing, right? And uh, so the NPC, CCPCC, et cetera, the government bodies, uh, they, uh, they've done also, they, they put in effort to ensure gender equality and employment in 2013. Uh, that's right after China's uh, first gender discrimination lawsuit. Yeah. And uh, so uh, the Federation also supported uh, students' protest against unequal recruitment process in China and uh, there are also laws, regulations put in uh, place by the government just to prohibit gender discrimination in hiring and uh, paying process uh, in the recruitment process at the same time to promote social security, childcare, uh, safe work environment for women. So uh, the government has uh, speed up uh, trying to solve this problem uh, after the first uh, gender discrimination uh, lawsuit and the following uh, practice, uneth unethical practice of uh, hiring recruitment. And uh, in 2019, the government banned employers in China from posting men preferred or men only job advertisement. So this is very good. I, I just want to you know, take that. This is a great thing <laughs> because you see uh, uh, in 2017, we can see the Baidu's advertisement. Uh, it says uh, they just prefer men, but ever since 2019, employers couldn't do that anymore. And the government also banned companies from asking women seeking jobs about childbearing and marriage plans were requiring applicants to take pregnancy tests. Yeah, so employers are not allowed to ask people, uh, hey, do you have plan to have children? Do you have plan to get married? And, uh, you know, 
things like that and or to require women to take tests to see if they're pregnant or not because this this is private thing this is unrelated to work okay so this standardization really helped okay now we're moving to the third part the third part is on rural urban uh, divide so the first thing we're looking at is how you see this picture these are migrant women uh, working in a toy factory yeah and uh, some of these factories are actually called the sweatshops uh, where the work working condition is very poor and these women get paid very little and uh, they're not treated equally and uh, as you know they are coming from uh, the countryside moving to the city and the city people look down on them as well and it's just uh, life is really so hard for this marginalized group uh, so that's why I'm using this picture there uh, to show this uh, urban rural divide uh, the social stratification in China <laughs> Okay, uh, let me erase these um, marks. Okay, who call system? We need to talk about who call system first when we talk about rural urban divide because who call system is a source of inequality. Yeah, so the who call system or called household registration system was launched in 1958. Uh, this is a household registration system that used by the state to control the movement of people between rural and urban areas. I got some allergy. Sorry. And hukou system is used to ensure social political stability through uh, internal, eternal migration control. Yeah. So the government divided population into two parts, agricultural and non-agricultural uh, population. So people in the rural areas, they uh, receive very limited resources, uh, whereas people in cities, they receive uh, a lot of benefits, entitlements, uh, for example, um, education, free education for kids, uh social uh stipends and uh, uh and other allowances uh, and uh so this really hindered the rural people's mobility and their access to these social resources that created a social certification and uh prohibited uh people from uh, uh you know moving up uh to change their uh their lives, etc. And uh, there's a problem around that system, and you can see from this uh, video. I'm just cl quickly clicking on this uh, video. Let's have a look at the vocal system. <laughs> Now we have to talk about the hukou system. It's the household registration system in China, which basically prevents migrant workers from accessing social services like healthcare and education in the cities that they're working in. And it seems to me like a deeply discriminatory system. This is a huge problem in China. Uh, when I talk to migrant workers about you know, a vast array of problems, I think this usually rises to number one. Mm. And I think the, the for them, uh, the biggest reason that this is such a big problem is that they are treated like illegal immigrants mm -hmm. inside of their own country. Mm -hmm. um, and for them, I think one of the biggest issues within the hukou problem is their children. Uh, many children who are born uh, in, these, in these larger cities where their parents have moved to, this is, this, this is their hometown as far as they know it. They grew up in Shanghai, for example. And as far as they're concerned, they're local citizens. But once they turn a certain age, if they want to go to college someday, they're going to have to move to where their household registration is, which means to where their parents are from, their lao jia, their, their home village. And that is incredibly disruptive to the entire family because all of a sudden these children at around age 15 or 16 have to move to their home village, usually live with their grandparents. They're not with their parents anymore. And all of a sudden, their grades start slipping, and many of them don't even graduate. 
and and then you, you, so you have this whole underclass of people right. who are discriminated against purely on the basis of where they're from, and, and that's not fair. And just some context: in Beijing, a population of 20 million, one third of that population are migrant workers. Right. One third of the people in Beijing don't have access to these social services because of the hukou system. Will there be reform? The problem is, is that the finances of the of the health care schemes and the education is all done at the local level. Right. So I think it's very difficult for the government at the national level to say, okay, let's just reform the HUCO system, mm -hmm. because it involves detailed finances of all the different provinces and cities. But it's certainly going to become a huge issue, especially mm -hmm. since, as Rob said, some of these kids grew up in the cities. They grew up in Beijing, so they're completely different from the migrant workers 20 years ago who were from the farm going to the big cities. They are city kids, and they, they don't know how to farm. They don't know the first thing about farming. So that going back home is not really an option for them. Um, on the other hand, there's another problem, is that many migrant workers who work in the big cities can't afford to keep their kids exactly. with them. Mm. So there's about 60 million children who are growing up in the, their hometowns, the home villages, often being um, raised by the grandparents and these are called left behind children in Chinese. It's very good that Raylan raised the, the, the issue of um, the left behind children, the Liuzhou Artong, mm -hmm. because actually, um, as just millions of Liuzhou Artong left behind children in rural home cities, hometowns in, in, in China, um, they've got a lot of social problems. Yeah. And the uh, juvenile crime rate in the rural counties in China is, is actually very high. And we are very mm -hmm. amazed and very. How come this, this, this problem happened in, in many villages in China without drawing attention from the local government? I'm sorry, Pan. I think you muted yourself. We can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you for reminding me. Uh, okay. Yeah. So now you could hear me. Uh, what I was saying is I was trying to give you different perspectives of people uh, seeing uh, different phenomena, just like Huko system. We could see uh, these foreign people are very critical of China's Huko system, right? And because, um, you know, they created social stratification, uh, which is true, right? And uh, for China's consideration, China wanted to really maintain this social stability, it, it, you know, etc., and then to better control the population population movement, it has its own point as well. So we're not seeking an answer who is right, who is wrong. Uh, we're just seeing different perspectives on this. And uh, so uh, the message here is Hoko system uh, does uh, create a, 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 you know, a barrier for uh, rural and urban, uh, for especially for rural population to move to urban China. And uh, and, and Hukou system indeed is a key institution for uh, defining an individual's opportunities and uh, that individual's social economic position and identity in China. And this is true. But the other, what you also need to know is China has been uh, reforming the Hukou system, especially after 1978. Things are getting better and better. People, especially in rural China, are given more opportunities uh, to work in urban area and they, you know, kept receiving uh, more and more benefits uh, despite, uh, you know, problems remain. The social certification remains. Yeah. And uh, so the Hukou system, uh, uh, since ever since it's um, relaxed, there are millions of rural uh, workers uh, migrated into China, and those migrant workers, a third, uh, you know, uh, many of them are actually uh, women uh, uh, moving from rural China to urban China. That's more than uh, one third of the population, the floating population, are women. And nearly 50% uh, are between uh, 16 to 25 year old, pretty young, just 
you know, like you uh, in your early 20s. I guess you were in your early 20s, right? Yeah, or mid 20s. And, uh, and uh, these migrant women, they are much more younger than their male counterparts. These are some of the demographic uh, characteristics of the uh, population. And women tend to migrate from a shorter distance uh, rather than males. Uh, and uh, they are likely to migrate within a province. Um, so once they migrated to the city, uh, they face a different kind of, you know, challenges and difficulties. Uh, and they're having this, um, you know, face discrimination at workplace and um, have to suffer from the, the discrimination given the urban and rural gulf and there. And that created a lot of issues like women's safety issues. Um, uh, the prejudice that they 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 they, they faced, uh, inequalities, uh, their health, you know, their payment, and many other ethical issues. Just uh, like the sweatshops that we mentioned, you saw the picture. Uh, many many of the migrant women actually were working in those factories in cities, and a very limited space, very harsh working condition, substandard. They work very long hours especially with very little pay and uh etc etc and then they even face abuse at workplace uh, and sexual harassment also uh, so there are some videos uh that you could watch uh factory girls for example or china blue uh, china blue is a bit longer and you'll see the stories of these factory girls in china and this is the group we really need to you know, give greater attention to, uh, not only because they're from rural side of China, right? Uh, from the, the urban rural divide, we could see, uh, but also, you know, they themselves as humans, uh, uh, the, the inequalities that, that they face, um, etc. And then for this week's reading, uh, as you've done, um, one is uh, the six short essays written by a migrant woman called the Fan Yu Su, yeah, in both Chinese and English. And, uh, I certainly recommend you, you know, to read that if you haven't done so. So uh, this one, this lady is Fan Yu Su. Uh, what I want to ask you or the questions for you to think of, uh, if we don't have enough time today, is um, what were Fan's struggles uh, documented in her biographical essay? It's quite uh, amazing, you know, for me to see a migrant woman could write these beautiful essays. Yeah, she didn't receive, you know, a lot of education like you and me. Uh, she didn't go for college, but she wrote essays and those essays just documented the real life stories and the, with philosophies, you know, those genuine experiences and feelings are very precious uh, for us to learn fun about Fan Yusu, her family, and, uh, you know, uh, the group of migrant workers in China. Yeah, she's like the voice uh, of migrant women. And other questions include the social problems and gender issues that raised uh, by Fan Yu Su, uh, especially uh, uh, she documented stories that happened during China's transition, uh, China's massive social and economic changes uh, under the economic reform. And uh, also uh, see any sentences that you think that you really like. I do that. Yeah, when I read articles, I read academic articles or essays, I highlight not only the arguments, but also the sentences that I think are quite useful and uh, the beautiful ones. You just do that too. You know, I think it's very helpful. You annotate that test. And uh, so I want you to do that. The last thing what I wanted to say is um, we are going to write this critical reflection, right? So um, for some of you who choose to do the critical re reflection rather than the essay, some key concepts uh, uh, and useful information that you could include uh, in, in your uh, <coughs> critical reflection. Uh, for example, the, some, some theories like the mobility theory, like, um, you know, anything you wanna discuss basically, but not a lot 
uh, and uh, go deep, uh, deepen your analysis and uh, outline the things that you haven't really learned prior, but that you learned from the lecture, from the tutorial, uh, based on other people's presentation on their case studies and based on the readings. I want you to reflect on that. Uh, the term uh, is uh, reflect, uh, reflection. So think, how would you apply some of the learned concepts and knowledge to study gender in China and to study other subjects or even, you know, outside the classroom and if any concepts. Yeah, I've, I've mentioned that. And, and also what have I, you know, what have you learned uh, from the readings, tutorials, presentations, etc. that really, you know, helped you uh, with your um, understanding. So, uh, uh, Another note is self-reflection is, you know, only useful when followed by thoughtful action. When you reflect, you write down things, you think, and, uh, and you, you know, that's how we progress, how, that's how we improve our understanding on things, uh, on, a, on the knowledge we learned, and that's how we get things retained in our brain, yeah, and, uh, let me just ask you, you know, we have a couple of minutes left. Is there any questions that I can help you with? And I noticed at the right beginning, you know, nobody was asking me any questions. And uh, this is the end uh, of this lecture. See if, you know, anything about the critical reflection you want me to, you know, to, 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 um, to say anything that you want to ask for or, other assessments or today's content. This is a, yeah, great to do it. Uh, I saw people type there. Uh, CC wrote, would you want us to write an introduction and conclusion? Uh, if you mean the critical reflection uh, or the essay, I want you to talk to me directly. Can you just uh, talk to me instead of typing? This, I think, is easier for us to communicate. Are you referring to the critical reflection or the essay or yes, what? Yes, the critical reflection. Okay, so the critical reflection, uh, an intro and conclusion is, um, is not that uh, necessary, but you can certainly structure your piece like that, just a, like a short essay by having an intro body and conclusion, the standard uh, way of doing that. But for, you know, the other way to do that is to frame the way that you like. But when you're doing the research essay, I just want to, you know, be clear, you need an introduction a body and conclusion. We're talking about the 2,500 word essay. You need that. But for the critical reflection, you don't have to use that you know, framework, you can, you know, frame the way you like, because I have provided you with um, some scaffolding questions, and you can certainly frame your piece that way. Uh, if you want me to show you, I can show you. This is um, in our uh, Moodle site, a eh? Moodle site, where is that? Um, if, if you go on our model site and see assessment brief and you'll see I've provided some scatter scaffolding questions one sec and here I'm on this page and you will see here, let me look for assessment brief. Where is assessment brief? It's here. And uh, I have updated this assessment brief. I've, um, I sent a message to you, right? Uh, I sent an announcement the other day. So for this one, the writing task, the second option here, let me just uh, use my pen here. Say below is an outline that you could borrow to frame the critical reflection. You could outline, hey, uh, what have you learned from that, uh, from the, you know, the lectures and tutorials, discussions, etc., and uh, answer the so what question.
that's where that you go uh, deep and uh, you need to show your understanding about the issues from different perspectives. Yeah, it could be academic, personal, or any other kind of perspective and uh, present your argument there. And then you say, you know, you answer the question, now what? How will you apply that? So by looking at this suggested uh, pattern, this is not intro, body and conclusion. Right. This is like what, so what, and now what pattern. Yeah, I hope I have answered your question, Sissy. Yes, thank you. Okay, no worries. And other people that I can help with? Any other questions? Hi, Pan. Oh, may I ask a question about sure. personal interpretation? Uh-huh, Ling Li, oh, right, yes. yep. Mm. Hi, Pan, I just uploaded our per our presentation and I cannot see my PowerPoint. I only can see the Word document. So do I need to like combine two PDF and upload again? Uh, yeah, what you could do is you type everything up in PPT and you save that file as PDF and then you upload that PDF to turn it in. Okay, so because of, we are doing the pair work, so we need to, we both need to upload or just one person to? Yes, yes. I can show you a sample, right? Uh, let me just show you a sample um, in Moodle again. Am I missing Moodle again? Yeah, so in Moodle, uh, what I want to show you is, um, what is that? Uh, I have a lot of courses. What I want to show you is the media course that we did. Basically, just to show you the idea that, you know, the thing that you were after about the presentation. Let me look for this. I think it's here. And, uh, or I could uh, look for my folder. <laughs> Maybe that's easier. And where is that? Uh, I think it's here. Student work. Nope. No. 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 Okay. There is some. This one. Oh, here. Okay. I got it. Here. So something you know will look like this. You have this PPT right here. One, two, three, four, five. But this is not standard. I'm not asking you to follow this. That's why I'm not sharing this sample in Moodle. You have your own way, right? So basically you have your PPT there and then you have your script. See, this is called transcript. What each slide talks about. Slide one, two, three, four, five blah 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 this is an hd sample that people could borrow but again you don't have to follow that you can just write a you know an essay and documenting what's the story and you may just don't want to you know do dot points for each slide or integrate that as a whole yeah did i answer your question Ling Li? yes thank you and Pam, where is uh, yeah sure we if we're doing pass, do we need to upload the document separately or one copy is fine? Uh, one, just uh, one. please, yeah, uh, put everything together. And, and uh, oh, and your question was, um, you were doing pair presentation, right? Yeah, pair presentation. So do we need yeah. to upload the document separately, like, or just uh, one? No, just, just one, one, just one will do, because yeah, you will have your names there. So yeah. James will, will read, yeah, who, you know, do that together and then, he will mark that together so he won't miss that yep okay thank you no problem and uh, other people that i can help with any questions uh, uh, may i ask a question about personal oh. interpretation uh, oh. because Sorry. in the marking criteria it mentions originality like you should construct your personal interaction uh, interpretation in a unique and interesting way so I was thinking if I want to uh if I want to write a mini essay, how can I construct them in an interesting way? Uh I mean if you want to do an essay, uh you can do an essay. Yeah. 
And uh, I mean, the content itself could be interesting and very engaging and creative ideas that people haven't mentioned. That's how you demonstrate your understanding about gender in China in an innovative way. I mean, the style could be an essay, it could be a website, it could be an audio or poster, etc. you want to do. Uh, at this stage, I want to show you something fun that I created earlier. That's not about gender in China. That's um, about a, a work that I did. Uh, let me see. And, uh, let me just, uh, let me just uh, get that um, focus. This is um, something fun, right? I did for my homework and when I was doing a, um, gee, that doesn't allow me. I can show you my work next time. It's just a, uh, a website. It seems it doesn't allow me to do that right now. Uh, yeah, I can show you my website next time. Basically, did I answer your question, uh, Joy? Your yes, ideas, yeah. Okay, yeah, your ideas could be, you know, innovative and creative and make that content engaging. So the style, it doesn't matter, you know, regardless what you do, whether you read it out, you make a video essay, or you do a poster, or you, you do, say, an interview, etc. doesn't matter. What matters is the idea. Yeah. Okay. Any other people I can help with? Um, yeah. Hi, Pen. Because um, for uh, whatever is for the presentation or the essay, sometimes, like, we want to have some uh, research in Chinese. Is that fine? Yeah, of course. Yeah, as you are bilingual, that's um, that's great. Yeah, use both Chinese and English sources. And for um, for the Chinese sources you used, uh, would be good to you know include the translation. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. The article, yeah, as references. And uh, when you do the presentation, make sure each uh, Chinese text that you have, uh, you know, a translation just to explain what that one is. And that will help, you know, all of us to understand. Uh, okay, people. okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Yeah, others that I can help with. We have three minutes and then we can uh, call it a day and then can go for the toot. No other questions. So everybody is happy. No more questions for now. Okay, if there is no questions, then we can call it a day and you can go for the tutorial often an hour. And uh, okay, and uh, have another great week, everybody. I'll see you next week. Yep. I'm going to... Um...